So I'm going to talk about the journey to safe autonomous uh, mobility because uh, that, that really is where the game is, I think, uh, globally. So, uh, so without any further ado, let me just explain wh why we focus on that and where we think we are on the journey and uh, what, what you might expect to see next. So I guess uh, 160 million Europeans live in towns and cities with more than 100,000 people in them. Uh, those people spend on average about two and a half thousand dollars a year on mobility across the city. And uh, so that, that obviously means it adds up to an enormous market that's going to emerge over the next 10 years, which is a, roughly a 400 billion dollar annual market. Um, so you can see that the, the scope and the, and the size of this opportunity, it really, really is truly massive. Um, uh, the UK is probably the most urbanised of all those, uh, all those places globally and, and it's not difficult to find where the vast majority of mileage in the UK comes from. So roughly 800 billion kilometer passenger, mile, uh, passenger kilometres we do per year and it's very much dominated by the car, the van, the taxi. Um, and you can see that you know, over the last 60 years, it's not surprising that our cities have got congested and polluted with the sort of the amount of traffic that's now going through them. Uh, London is a great microcosm of this, actually. Um, and in fact, it's Europe's only megacity uh, is London. About 8.8 .8 million people live here. And if you look at you know, what's inside the city boundaries, it's significantly bigger than any other European city. Uh, today in London, 54% of households own at least one car and 64% of those use it to commute. Um, so they're spending roughly $18 a day on uh, transport. Um, they are sitting slumped behind a wheel for 230 hours a year on average and they're doing that at roughly 10 kilometres per hour. Um, so yeah, we, obviously we've got to be able to do better than that in terms of figuring out what we do with our transport systems. So, I mean, the answer is a new form of shared urban transport um, in which vehicles are all electric, um, yeah, a heterogeneous fleet. So if you get picked up at 2 a.m., it's a small vehicle. You get picked up at 7 a.m., it's a tube that looks a bit like a bus. Um, it's got to be aligned with and support public transport. And, um, but it only makes sense economically if it's autonomous. Um, if it's autonomous, the cost of that comes down to roughly $6 per day per person. Um, and uh, yeah, so for that, people can get around the city um, and they recover the 230 hours that they're otherwise spending uh, commuting in, in traffic. So um, you can kind of break, so, so what are we waiting for? Uh, well, I guess, I guess broadly the technical challenges can be broken into perception challenges and prediction challenges. Um, most of the work so far um, has really been on highway driving, what are called level two, level three autonomy, where you look at maybe four interesting dimensions, uh, two in perception, two in prediction. You know, the number of classifiers, the number of things you've got to classify, the precision recall you've got to hit, uh, the number of actors and the state space those actors might move into. And highway driving does call for very good precision uh, so we, we do care about the number of false positives. We don't want our system to be slamming on the brakes. And be, but because it's a human then, it's level two, level three, you, know, you can maybe afford uh, a, a weaker recall. Urban driving, though, is hard. Urban driving, you know, we actually need very high precision and very high recall at the same time. Uh, the number of things we've got to classify could be many, many more. And in terms of prediction, the number of actors we might care about in the scene goes from maybe four or five to maybe 20. Um, and the state space those actors move into becomes vast, actually. So it's a, it's a significantly harder problem, a problem that you know, many people are sort of working out how to tackle globally. And if you just take one of those measures, precision recall, let me just sort of explain, I mean, roughly where the state of the computer science is right now. So every, every year, um, in fact, on a continuous basis, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology uh, allows people to test their latest models and algorithms on a test data set and publish the results. This is the precision recall curve for cyclist detection. So obviously in a city, cycle detection is obviously quite important. Um, there are two sets that they look at, an easy set in which the objects are not particularly occluded, lighting is good, and then a, a hard set 
where they may be partly occluded or the, the lighting is not so good. Cyclists are particularly hard to detect because you've not got that many pixels. They're, they're slightly transparent. They're quite easy to confuse with other objects. Um, and, and so roughly, if you look at, you know, pick a point in that precision recall curve, and you, you obviously you have to pick a point on that. I've just picked a random one here. The, that would say that if you can live with 10% of detections being false positives, you suffer something like 25% of the cyclists uh, that you that, that, that are there, you fail to detect them. The, the same is true of the uh, hard set, though, and in this case, uh, we're roughly 30% on each case. Um, so in other words, in a hard set of cases, you know, taking the state-of-the-art computer vision technology on a global basis, we're going to miss about 30% of the cyclists. And the cyclists that we do spot, 30% of them are going to be false positives. Um, so you can see that we, yeah, we're actually miles away from being ready for some of this stuff in the city today. So we've got a lot more work to do. And, and safety, obviously, is the gating factor for putting two tons of metal on our streets at 40 miles an hour towards vulnerable humans. Yeah, this stuff's got to be safe, actually. So, uh, so it can't be a piece of experimental science that's not, uh, not reliable. Humans that we're competing with are pretty good. Yeah, so we've got these amazing things. Eyes, 130 million pixels per eye. Yeah, we got a dynamic range of roughly 200 dB, so it's obviously huge. Um, we, we have, uh, we have a, a visual cortex of something like 4.3 billion neurons. Um, and then we train that over maybe 16 years uh, before we actually put anybody in a car to drive. Uh, and they get trained for you know, 365 days a year, 16 hours a day. Um, so we've got this enormous amount of training data, to be honest, lots and lots of context that we use. So we're competing with that, really. Um, fortunately, there's massive progress in this area. So you know, enormous amount of research, you know, experiment on lots of different techniques and so on. So we are, we are getting closer to the point where we can assemble a set of technologies that will get to safety. Um, and, uh, and some of those uh, involve actually classic stuff. So you know, this is a case where we've, uh, we've done a surface fitted 3D real-time uh, reconstruction of the scene. So we're basically taking binocular images. Um, we're matching points in them uh, using semi-global matching. Um, and then we're surface fitting uh, individual super pixels um, to a particular plane. And you can see that we're getting a pretty good view of the topology and the RGB of every pixel in the scene. Um, so, yeah, so some of it involves those kind of technologies. We also care about the semantics of that. So we care particularly about drivable surface. Um, and uh, and you know, in drivable surface, we might want to have a kind of hierarchical representation of that, in which we might want to care about lanes, for example. So we've got novel techniques that allow us to create annotated data for training our neural networks on lanes and then we're creating sort of general purpose lane detection algorithms and when you build memory into these systems you can also use it on quite cluttered urban environments and, and fairly reliably detect any kind of abstract lane layout structure. Um, it's not just the lane instances you care about, you might also care about what's the road center, you might care about what's the uh, lane edge, the road edge, you might care about what's the lane center. So you might want to hierarchically organize the semantic segmentation into these uh, individual layers. And again, make them very, very general purpose. Of course, uh, Identifying the objects in the scene uh, is quite important as well. So, you know, so typically, you know, you, we obviously have things like 2D object detection and classification, uh, the quality of which depends very much on the model you choose, the amount of training data you've got, you know, how you structure your learning and so on, um, but, uh, and how far away the object is, um, how occluded, what the lighting is, as we've seen on cycle detection. Um, and, uh, and it's possible to measure your confidence in those predictions that you're making. Um, 2G object detection is slightly problematic because the, the whole purpose of detecting objects means that you are essentially predicting object placements and identifying x, y dimensions in the 2D plane of where objects are. And those can very often, those proposals can overlap. So you end up with lots and lots of false positives. And it's quite hard to tell uh, what's a false positive and what's not. Um, and, and so one of the answers to that is to move to 3D object uh, detection training. Whoops, I'll go back a bit. Sorry. Oh, 
I'm not going to do it? OK. Is he going back? No, OK. Mm. Sorry about that. I seem to have crashed it. OK, so forget that. So, um, so, so 3D, 3D object detection is quite interesting because um, it allows us to um, identify in global space where everything is, and we can therefore eliminate false positives. This is now showing the fact that you know, in order to create lots of training data, really what you want to be able to do is to have very, very photorealistic uh, 3D simulations of the world. Um, so you know, a big chunk of what we do is building uh, full 3D reconstructions of the full 3D simulations of the world, and, and because we know perfect ground truth of what we put in that world, we have lots and lots of good training data for our deep neural networks. Um, so simulation is one of the keys to how we build these systems. And then we put that together in a hardware package. Um, so we're currently on our third platform. Um, so that is a Ford Fusion, um, known in Europe as Mondeo. Um, and in the Mondeo, yeah, we have yeah, tens of sensors, uh, cameras, radar, LIDAR, differential GPS, ultrasound, uh, IMUs. Um, we have um, distributed compute across the car. Um, so we have hundreds of teraflops of compute in the car, um, all based today on GPU. And, uh, and in order to power that, we have 100 kilograms of extra battery in the car. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, extra weight we put on the car uh, to do that. Um, and you know, we're currently going to bring up eight of those uh, for development testing and for requirements discovery in, in our cities. So safe urban driving, though, is the kind of goal, really. So I've described <clears throat> some of the fundamental technologies that we're working on to assemble the capability of doing this, but it's going to take a bit more to really be confident we can get to true safety. First thing we need to do is we're going to have to create very, very good digital twins of our cities. Um, so um, so that they need to be, in many cases, completely photorealistic. And in those digital twins, we need to be able to change the weather, the lighting, um, the, um, the object behaviors. We've got to be able to colors, uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, you know, the way rain falls, and so on. So we've got to change all those things in that model. We also want to need, we're going to need to make as much use of all the technology around us, all the capability we have to be able to accurately identify what's around us. We can't, we can't rely entirely on any individual sensing modality. So the use of priors, uh, our ability to therefore localize ourselves in order to work out what those, what those priors really are, and, uh, and even putting fiducials down on the road surface and around the road on traffic lights and so on, all of those are going to be necessary, I think, to allow us to get close to human levels of safety. We've got to use a, a variety of hierarchical and redundant 3D detectors and trackers um, for different sorts of uh, capability. And then we need to be able to sort of use multiple sensing modalities. And we've got to dis you know, discover really how we fuse them, um, how, how we make sure they're complementary, uh, and exactly where we fuse them in the pipeline, really. Uh, we need to calculate our confidence level um, of each of the sensing uh, capabilities. Um, and we've got to propagate that uncertainty through our stack. And that might lead to us driving you know, a bit more slowly if we're just not confident, for example. Um, we need to be able to predict human action. We can't drive in a city without predicting how people are going to react. Um, so, uh, so we've got to develop the capability of uh, recognizing and inferring human behavior, beliefs over that human behavior as we drive. And then we've got to run a massive validation and verification program if we're going to make sure that this stuff is safe. Much of that in simulation and a limited amount of it on, uh, on the road. So we're working on all these seven sort of techniques which we're assembling together to kind of build a safe urban driving system. Um, so most of the companies that you see doing this are really, uh, I guess, US and Chinese companies. Uh, so a vast majority of investment in this space has happened in in the West Coast, a bit on the East Coast, and then a huge investment more recently in China, really. And in Europe, um, for various reasons, we've been behind the curve. Um, 
And it is really important that we get back up that curve uh, because the talent to do this definitely exists here in Europe and uh, the market obviously exists to do it. And uh, I guess our job is to catalyze the, those two things together uh, with the aim of, yeah, let's build a European company to focus on European cities. Um, the reason that sort of makes sense is if I'm trying to tackle this problem as a US company, I'm probably much more likely to want to punch all the way through in a US city first, partly because it's easier and partly because it's close to home. And the same is true in China. Uh, and Europe is actually a bit harder. Um, so I think Europe is like second on everybody's list. So there is a window of opportunity for us to build a company to do just this. But our cities obviously are essentially medieval in structure and that, that is a bit different to uh, US cities. So it's not gonna be easy or it's not gonna be cheap to build a company we're building. Um, yeah, we've put together a leadership team, actually most of us from the semiconductor and communications world. We've added yeah, a, a very large number of uh, talented leaders uh, from the worlds of academia, from gaming, um, from transport, and from the world of uh, machine learning and computer vision. And, um, and we've been growing the company fairly steadily for the last few quarters. So we're, we're about 100 people now, 97 is the current count. We should cross 100 this week, I think, actually. Um, by the end of next year, we're going to have to be something like 250 to kind of cover the bases here. Uh, and by the time we launch a service, it's probably way over 1,000, I think. Funding-wise, we raised some seed money. Um, we got the UK government to write the biggest single check to invest in a company building this technology, which is a $15 million check uh, back in April last year. We then raised a Series A round of funding led by Lakestar, uh, an $18 million round. And then forthcoming, we'll be doing a Series B round of funding to give us the fuel, take us all the way through to a sort of strong demonstration in London. And the prize, though, is massive, not just the financial prize, the addressing that you know, $400 billion market. Um, but I think, I think it actually does go beyond that, really. Uh, really, our ability to really make our cities better for everybody. And that's very much the kind of goal that we have. Thank you very much.